flight number three of Bordeaux. So with this flight, I want to try and give us a little bit of synthesis on the idea, again, that the wines can taste like the place that they're from. I also want to talk about the Bordeaux family of varieties just a bit more. I want to think a little bit about on vintages of Bordeaux because it is a fairly marginal climate. And I also want to explore some of the controversies that go on in Bordeaux at this present time. We'll hope that I can make it through them all, and we'll hope that you guys can make it through all of your glasses of wine. As always, just keep drinking while I'm talking about these issues, and we'll see where we can get to. Now, one of the first things I wanted to think about is this pyramid system again that we talked so much about in the second flight, the Grand Cru Classé system. One of the very interesting things that's going on with the Grand Cru Classé system since the 1980s is you have chateaus that are now producing second wines. Now this is a bit confusing of terminology because we of course have second growths. So what is a second wine? Well, a second wine for most chateaus is a wine that they would say is more forward drinking than their main wine. So you have a second growth wine that is producing their main wine, and of course it's Bordeaux, and it's expensive Bordeaux, and it's meant to age, meaning that it will be best maybe seven, maybe 10, maybe 20 years in bottle from the point that you buy it, maybe even further. That's their main wine. And they want to produce it so it ages because that's the magnificence of Bordeaux. But of course not everyone has a cellar, so they want to produce a wine that's a little bit more forward, meaning that it drinks earlier. And so most chateaus nowadays produce what's called a second wine, and it's the more forward drinking wine. It's an interesting concept, and it's also one of the more controversial, or what once was more controversial in Bordeaux. Controversial because most people, when Chateaus announced that they were producing a second wine, thought, well, this is clearly an inferior wine. It's a wine that's maybe made from young vines, maybe made from less concentrated vines, produced uh, grapes in, you know, not as good areas, doesn't see as much oak, or maybe doesn't see as much expertise in the winery. So that's, of course, one way to think about these second wines, is that they're inferior wines to the main wine. I'll tell you, all chateaus in Bordeaux, and especially those in this 1855 classification system, are at pains to tell you that's not the case. It's not necessarily made from young wines. There's no difference in the enology or viticultural team. There's maybe not much difference in the winemaking practices either. Rather, they're making a wine that is more forward, meaning you can drink it now. Well, how could that be? One way that could be is an increasing use of a grape variety that gives you more ripe, plump wines with less structure. That would mean that you have wines that are more heavily oriented towards Merlot versus Cab. And you can see this happening in Bordeaux because Merlot plantings have spiked quite a lot since the early 1980s and continue to go up. Now, in 2020, things have settled out a little bit and Cabernet has increased, but there's all kinds of other things. But before Merlot was starting to become the dominant variety, maybe even on the left bank as well. So changing the plantings to make a more forward wine. Or it could just be that when you're in the winery, and I've had this experience, when you're barrel tasting, certain barrels just always come across as more approachable, meaning they show more fruit and they show less acidity and they show less tannin. And so those get blended then down into the second wine. Now, a final argument Chateaus would make is the second wine gives the approach for you as the consumer you get to know the savoir faire of the winery, meaning you get to experience the winery, but you don't have to pay absolute top shelf prices. So for all the first growths, I think all of them make a second wine, you get to have a 
touch of the sparkle of the first growth magic, but you don't have to pay sky high prices in order to experience it. And then in all of this, you get to have an experience of second growths or fourth growths or fifth growths, but you get them at an easier price. And then also you get them in a way where you could buy those and taste those second wines while you're waiting for your main wines to age. So a mix of different opinions about what second wines are and what they're doing to Bordeaux and how they're making Bordeaux and reshaping it. For us, we can take a taste and a glimmer of this with this wine, Pouillac. And it's an interesting one because while I just spent the last couple of minutes talking about second wines, here you actually have now a third wine. A third wine meaning that this comes from the owners of Lynch Bage. And Lynch Bage is a wonderful property of fifth growth in the Grand Cru Class A system, affectionately nicknamed by uh, British lunch bags, and for many years was incredibly cheap for the quality that you got out of its fifth growth. It, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's so affectionately known is it was inexpensive as a fifth growth, yet performed at a second growth uh, level. Lynchbage produced a second wine and still produces a second wine called Echoes of Lynchbage. But now they produce a third wine which they simply label Pouillac, and we're going to come back to Pouillac in a second. Now, here I think the idea is it gives you the expression of Lynchbage in the place that they're from, which is the village of Pouillac. So one way to look at it is it's hearkening back to the terroir, but also giving you this magical experience of a wonderful chateau, but at very reduced prices. Now, when I taste and smell this wine, I actually happen to agree with it. I think it's a magically drinking Pouillac, uh, particularly right at this moment. But you could also say that, well, it takes away from Lynch Bage, or it cuts into the main wine production, or this fragmentation of things means that the main wine becomes so either explosively uneconomical or maybe the main wine becomes such a long-term wine that it makes it something that you can't enjoy. Again, all fragments to think about with the idea of uh, second wines and then now third wines. I do have to emphasize this is not in our 1855 classification system. This is actually yet beyond that again. So while the 1855 classification system is incredibly strange for France and very unique for the rest of the world, this idea of second wine and third wine is yet another add-on to what I consider to be a very unusual system. Now, I personally have to say, I've lived through these controversies of second and now third wines, and by and large, uh, to my palate, I think they're oftentimes very wonderful, and oftentimes a very gracious way to understand what a chateau is doing without the high price of the main wine. Also, to my palate, I think that oftentimes there are wines that are open and expressive upon release, which means that for those of us who are beginning to taste Bordeaux, we can start tasting great chateaus, but in a format that gives us something to drink now, meaning it shows the fruit and characteristic of the chateau, which the main wine may not show for many, many years. Still a little bit of a controversy, so you'll have to decide. So again, Pouillac by Lynch Bage. I'm gonna take taste. Puyac is our final village on the left bank to explore, and I think this shows it off really well. Puyac is known for having gravelly soils, and indeed the most famous chateau on it, and it has three first growths, one of them being Latour, has very gravelly soils, which make incredibly powerful structured Cabernet. So Puyac as a region is known for its power. So here on the left bank we have now again a return to the idea of terroir because we have four villages like we would have had or like we do have in Burgundy that express different things in wine. 
And those four villages, starting from the north, are Sanistep, then Puyek, then San Julian, and then Marco. So we've had them all at this tasting, and I encourage you to keep exploring those villages because no matter how much of this or economics go on, I do think those wines will show through in the character of the terroir. That's another reason in particular that I wanted to show you this one. Okay, now I normally like to end these tastings on kind of a bang, meaning that we show off really expensive wines and I would love just appreciate as a wine merchant if you went and bought some very expensive wines for us. But I thought maybe for this essay, we would just take a thought about what else goes on in Bordeaux and what else you can explore and how we can maybe find some real interesting values in Bordeaux and again, approach the controversies that are going on in Bordeaux. Well, one of the most interesting things is this pyramid. 60 producers that relatively have remained unchanged and they produce some of the finest wines in the world and have for nearly 800 years. And those wines are of exceptionally high value. And so I don't think that system is going to change anytime soon. And in some ways you could say these are the real winners, meaning both that they get a lot of dollars into their wineries, but also there are losers to that. Now, maybe we don't call them losers in this day and age, but one of the interesting things is below this pyramid, you have 8,000 other producers in Bordeaux. Two ways to take that. Those 8,000 other producers are struggling, or those 8,000 other producers are producing wine for us that we can find at exceptional values. So, we'll have to explore. Now, just below this level, if you will, is the qualification of Cru Bourgeois in Bordeaux, and that's the second wine that we're going to have. It means that the wines have to be slightly more alcoholic, which used to be a concern in Bordeaux of not getting high alcohol levels, and then it's also a grading system. So Cru Bourgeois just below and Chateaus can apply for that level. So if you like, I think it's always fun to go and purchase a bunch of Cru Bourgeois wines, both up and down the villages of the Medoc, so you can get a sense of, or the left bank, so you can get a sense of what those villages produce, but also maybe buying more than just one bottle of them, maybe four or five bottles of each, because generally they're less expensive, and then you get a chance to explore the difference, excuse me, explore the age-worthy capacity of these Bordeaux. Maybe you have one now, and you have one in six months, and then the second in 12 months, and then third in 24 and 36 months, but you get to see the wines change in age. And I think that's one of the glories of Bordeaux and Cru Bourgeois' way to do that, but not necessarily have to dedicate your entire bank account to doing it. So a great way to start a seller of Bordeaux and see how the wines change at an easy pace. So here with this one, we're back up in Sanistef. And I think this is fascinating for you guys to think about if you remember the Zorm de Pez from the first flight. Because it gives you two glances at Santa Stef. And, but Les Zorms has a connection that we should know that may alter your thoughts. Les Zorm de Pez from the first flight is actually owned by Lynch Bosch, the people who made the Puyac. So in interconnective experience of having this, which is not owned by Lynch Bosch, and then having the Puyac, which is owned by Lynch Bosch, and then having the Lazorm de Pez, which is owned by Lynch Bosch. Maybe a chance for you to think about the difference between the location versus the winemaking team, because the winemaking team at Lynch Bosch and Lazorms is the same. take a moment and think about the Bordeaux grape family. And I think this is a really interesting one to think about. And again, harkens back to our third lecture, uh, well, and our fourth, because in our third we had Burgundy, which is mono variety. And then our fourth we had lots of different varieties going together. But by and large, we just knew what those varieties were and left them at that fact. 
Here, and I think this is an interesting exercise that every week can, everyone can do, maybe in a separate tasting, is blend the Bordeaux varieties on their own. Now, if you remember the first tasting that we did together, we often talked about fruit character, and then we talked about tannin, and then we talked about acidity. Now, if we go through the Bordeaux varieties, we can actually chart this, and then we can think about why they go together. Now, our first variety would be Cab. Now, Cab in Bordeaux is not like Cab in Napa Valley, so we have to moderate it a little bit, because many of us have tasted mostly Napa Valley. Fruit character in Bordeaux for Cabernet is what we would say maybe a medium. Tannin character would be high, and acid character could be high as well. Now this relates to the idea and the fact that Bordeaux, especially in the left bank, is relatively a maritime climate because of the Atlantic coast, even though it's protected, but you still have the Gironde estuary coming in. So if that's your character of the wine, well, that makes an interesting wine, but you know, maybe a fairly top tense wine. So what do we do if we add Merlot into our family of grape vine, or grapes that we can make into wine? Well, Merlot tends to have a fairly high fruit character, even in Bordeaux, and we saw that in our saint Emilion. but it also tends to have a fairly low tannin and low acid character to it. Now, I think you can see this is part of the idea that the pairing of the grapes makes something greater than if they were just separate. These two naturally add something to one another, which is, I think, why you see most Bordeaux's blended together. And this is the common pairing in both the left bank and also in um, Pessac. So Merlot adds fruitiness and richness to the palate and also tampers tannin and acidity. And winemakers can play with this and alter the shape of their wines because of these. Now, another major one that you'll see is Franc, Cabernet Franc. It's the genetic part of parent of Cabernet. Cabernet Franc, to me, tends to have very low fruit character, but also very high tannin and high acidity. Well, what's Cabernet Franc's natural partner? It would be Merlot. Merlot being the one that's very, very fruity, and Franc reinforces it, makes it more pronounced in smell, and also adds tannin and acid to it. So when you think about it, you actually now have the blending partners that are across all of Bordeaux. With these two, you get the left bank, and with those two, you get the right bank, for the obvious reasons that you see here. Those aren't all the great varieties. There are a couple of others. One of them is Petit Verdot. And to my understanding, when I've been talking to petit, uh, winemakers, Petit Verdot is a little bit like salt in cooking. You don't necessarily want to taste it, but it makes everything tastier, which is why you see Petit Verdot always in just minute quantities across Bordeaux, and indeed across Napa or wherever Bordeaux blends. Uh, find their place, Washington is an exception, is that you just get a little bit of it and it heightens everything, but you don't necessarily want to taste it. Another one is Malbec. Now, you don't see a lot of Malbec in Bordeaux, and I think the reason is, and you know, there's a bit of prejudice going to be revealed here, is that Malbec holds this character relatively in Bordeaux meaning it's high fruit, low tannin, low acidity, but it doesn't have the same elegance that Merlot does. Maybe that's because it doesn't have the same affinity to cloy, uh, cloy, clay soils that Merlot does, but almost always the preference is for Merlot instead of Malbec. But Malbec certainly adds a very high fruit character, but with a rich, weighty base note to it, very black. So Malbec would be the other one, and those would be the five. Carmenere was always the sixth that was legally included, but very rarely produced. To my understanding, as of 2019, it was opened up, and there are 15 other varieties 
I think a lot of those are due to climate change and focusing on what climate change could bring to Bordeaux, and I would say fairly experimental at this point. Now, we, before we lose this chart or go away from this chart, there's something interesting to think about Merlot. And the interesting to think, uh, the interesting thing to think here is that Bordeaux has often been a commercialized or is a commercialized wine experience and has been for many centuries. Well, as times change and people drink their wine faster and markets change, so that you're shifting away from a British aristocracy that could lay down wines for 10 or 20 years and give them to their grandchildren to taste and drink wonderfully. We tend to, especially as Americans, drink now. And what we buy, we drink right now. And for Bordeaux, and Bordeaux at the top levels, that kind of becomes a problem because if you're opening something and it's very heavy cab-based and was meant to age a long time, it now tastes taut, it tastes a little hard-edged, and it's not probably as delicious as what it would be in three to five years. So part of maybe all of this that's going on in these different factors is the idea that you want wines that are going to drink more forward. And so wineries are producing wines that are more forward again. We encountered the term forward with our second wines and our third wines, but here, more forward in a general scope means that Cabernet plantings have dropped, whereas Merlot plantings have increased. And why? Because Merlot is that ripe fruit character and low acidity and low tannic, meaning it's more forward as a wine. You can drink it more readily right now. That's a big shift in Bordeaux, and it's especially a big shift on the left bank. And some people would say that it's dramatically changing the character of the left bank. Now I can tell you that news that I'm bringing to you is now probably about three or four years old. And I think it's been a little bit changed uh, since three or four years. But the interesting thing is for the wines that are coming, Bordeaux is three or four years behind this present day. And so we're going to see this change in characteristics of the wine and we're going to notice it. Whether it's bad or good is up to us to taste and think about. But it certainly will be something fun to take the idea of the family of the Bordeaux varieties, mix them with the Grand Cru Class A system, and then also mix them with our thoughts about why we're buying Bordeaux and if we're buying it to age and how long will it age. Now, there's a lot more Bordeaux to explore. And usually, I would love to return to uh, the south to explore more of those wines, or to go farther afield into the depths of the uh, French countryside, or return to Pomerol and do a really wonderful Pomerol wine. And we can do all of that for you at Waterford, no problem. We can always change this up and do another and different lecture. But I wanted to end maybe on a down note, but on something controversial, and I think really fun and something new. I wanted to end going back to our first flight and thinking about our historical discussion of where Bordeaux started in Pesach. It was the southern area of Bordeaux. And if you remember my map, and God bless you if you do, the area from Pesach north to saint Emilion between the two rivers is actually the vast bulk of production of Bordeaux. There's a massive amount of vineyards there, and they're oftentimes run by generations of families. And they are, uh, if I had my scale here, they are actually underneath the Cru Bourgeois scale. So they go below the 1855 classification, below the Cru Bourgeois. There's a huge number of people out there in Bordeaux making wine that I think it's wonderful to visit. And in fact, it's that area, the Entre de Mer, between the two rivers, that makes the enormous bulk of Bordeaux, and most of it is very inexpensive. They are the ones who can't compete with the main chateau, and they're not sold on features, so you can find them and you can taste them. 
And I think if you go searching out for some of the better, more unique ones, you'll end up with a really great drinking Bordeaux experience, but maybe without the high price tag. Will they compete with the first growths and second, or for us, the third, fourth, fifths that we tasted? No, I don't think so. But what I would say to you is, when I've been in Bordeaux, oftentimes you don't need the drama of the absolute top. You may want to have something for lunch that's just great, easy drinking. You know, frankly, I know so many French who have family meal on Sunday, and it's just about family, and the wine accompanies that. So I wanted to take us through and show us wonderful, beautiful Bordeaux, which I love and collect myself, but I wanted to end on one which I think is great drinking and great value, and this is Chateau Laurent. So here, I think an interesting one for us, it is heavy and Merlot. Unlike what I just said, I don't think this Chateau is producing Merlot just for the sake of making this wine softer and easier, because I don't find it a necessarily soft and easy experience. What I would say is, it's great drinking bistro wine. It also has the beautiful notes of violets and a little touch of green character to the nose. Those characteristics you wouldn't find in Napa Cabernet. I think Napa producers would say it's underripe, but I would suggest to you, just think of a, a French ham sandwich with cornichons and butter. You know, you've got some green notes anyway, and then you've just got something drinking. So more to the point, I really wanted to end on, instead of a high note, which I certainly want to sell you and want to achieve, I want to attend on the idea that there's beautiful Bordeaux wine that's accessible at every level for you. And I hope that given the history, and culture, and complexities, that any and all of Bordeaux remains open to you as a gorgeous wine drinking region. Now, one more thing. I'll do it live because I can. We, of course, at Waterford are not doing this for charity. We'd like to sell you the wine. We do have a tasting sheet, which you have probably downloaded, but I can tell you on the website, we've actually programmed in the discount. So we offer a 20% discount on all these wines. If you bought the wines to taste with us, that's great. I really appreciate it. If you bought them singly or in parts, still really appreciate it. If you found one that you particularly loved, you can still use that discount code that's on the website to go into the French Wine Academy Session 4 of Bordeaux and buy more of what you liked from this tasting. We'll get it set up for you and then just call us or email us for delivery fulfillment options on your order. Thank you so much.